Welcome to the League of Women Voters Hot Topic Discussion with Roberta Winters. All of us at LWV CDC hope you and your family are staying healthy and safe during these challenging times. In the death of George Floyd, I would like to share with you the National League of Women Voters statement about the horrific event and the protests over the past 10 days. The League of Women Voters grieves the murders of George Floyd and the countless other black lives tragically taken at the hands of rogue law enforcement officers who are rarely held accountable for their actions. We also mourn those who have lost their lives or been harmed mentally or physically as a result of America's pervasive culture of anti-blackness, the system indivisible with liberty and justice for all. As an organization whose mission is to empower voters and defend democracy, we stand in solidarity with all black communities. The League shall do so not only by speaking out against racism in all forms, work required of us to be anti-racist, committed to listening to and amplifying black voices and educating ourselves and our children on the historic and ongoing systemic racism that plagues this country. The League acknowledges painfully that America is a nation founded on racism. Therefore, all who live in this country must contribute to and participate in organizations actively working to achieve full liberation and inclusivity. We must all advocate for anti-racist policies at every level of voting. Please join the League of Women Voters of Minnesota in calling on law enforcement officials to provide transparency during the investigation and justice for, for George Floyd, his family, and his community. Finally, we echo the call of our partners at the NAACP must all vote in November. The road to change lies at the ballot box. A brief update on the progress of the Delaware County Health Department, which we featured in our last Hot Topic discussion. County Council has announced that a county health department will be fully operational by the end of 2021. East staff, including a director and the Board of Health, will be appointed by early next year. The first health study by John Hopkins is expected to be completed in July, followed by an economic feasibility study. Both studies will be discussed at town hall meetings this summer. We will continue to update you about these town halls so you can participate and stay informed about this issue. Going forward, we will continue to offer our events in a virtual format schedule plan for 2021. Our hot topic programs will address and elections, misinformation in the media, criminal justice, reforming the culture of policing, county health department, and effective lobbying and advocacy techniques working with local legislators. Now, the League is so pleased to host Roberta Winners who is a dear friend of our league and, and president of the Radner LWV. He will lead a discussion on pipelines and environmental issues close to home. Roberta has been working on sustainability issues for decades and for environmental justice with the league and many local community groups. She will report to us what is currently happening in Delaware County and how to become more involved. Roberta will answer your questions during the Q&A segment. Roberta has prepared a list of resources on environmental issues, which we will provide to you as a follow-up after the program. We request that you remain muted during the presentation. Kowski will now update us briefly on several new developments with voter service and the elections process, followed by Jane Brennan, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Anne? Thank you. 
welcome to this presentation. Uh, Barbara asked me to do a very brief uh, overview of what happened with the election. And Olivia Thorne and I have been working with a team of people uh, on the election. And what Olivia and I did yesterday, so this is going to be real brief, is we updated the front page of our website, of the CDC LWV website. And on that front page, we put a statement with a link to the mail-in ballots being counted. And there's a streaming link, if people want to watch it, on that process. There's a statement there on that. We also put a link to the Pennsylvania Department of State, which is uh, the unofficial election results. And there's a link directly there for Delaware County's results. There's a lot that's happening in the future. Uh, we're planning to send a survey out to our members on their election experience via mail-in and or at the polling place. So we hope you will help us complete that survey and we want your opinions into that process. Barbara also asked me to just touch briefly on the opening of Delaware County. We are now in the yellow phase and uh, we put a link to that, uh, the processes and on that also, also on our website on our health department um, issues page. So it gives you all the details of what you need to do or know or not know about uh, the yellow phase where you can go, how many people can gather. And then it also has the next phase, which we hope to get into eventually, the green phase. So keep checking our website and we appreciate you being a member of our league. We also, in the chat, has we put a link to a brand new page for this presentation and actually also just on the environment and natural resources in general. But all the links and all the resources that Roberta is going to cover are linked on that page. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. So now Jane will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Roberta Winters has served two terms on the state board of the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania as director for natural resources and as vice president for issues and actions, respectively. She coordinated the Marcellus Shale Natural Gas Study Guides and chaired the addendum studies on pooling and pipelines. She currently serves as president of the Radnor League of Women Voters and advocates, as Barbara said, on numerous civic and environmental issues. Roberta combines her expertise as a retired elementary teacher with her background in science to connect the dots on important issues, such as those surrounding the natural gas operations in Delaware County. With no further ado, Roberta. My host has disabled my screen sharing. I let me make let me go ahead and make you another your co-host again. You should be able to do it now. There we go. So we're going to go look at pipelines. And our topic for today is pipelines, the pandemic, and the environment. So you know, pipelines really are the safest way to transport large quantities of hazardous materials over land for long distances, no surprise. One of the important things that happened recently, just about a year ago, President Trump issued executive orders that will now allow natural gas liquids and liquefied natural gas to be moved through trains. And that was based on an assessment, given the fact that this was never done before. They don't have a lot of um, data to support that for or against. So they decided we're going to try it. And it's also better than trucks. Now, this happens to be Marcus Hook. And it surprised me to know that we have about 200 propane carrying tankers that go into Marcus Hook and actually can do it every day to transport propane. And that's one of the reasons that the Mariner 2 is considered to be a public utility because in fact, they're distributing propane into our communities. They also have some big boats and they're going out of terminals in Marcus Hook. And, and most of the time it's going to Scotland and Sweden. 
again, they're large vessels under those tanks. They carry liquefied natural gas products, natural gas liquids, that's ethane, propane, and butane, usually to Scotland and to Sweden for plastics production. They exist all over the United States. We're not the only place in the country that has lots of natural gas pipelines. You can see here in the Philadelphia regions, the one that runs through Delaware County, and again, Chester and adjacent counties. And if you're looking for Delaware County alone, the blue ones are the natural gas lines, the red ones are the liquid petroleum products, and if you want to go, there's a pipeline mapping system and you can get further information about all of these pipelines, who operates them, what's running through them, what the pressures are and so on, through the National Pipeline Mac Mapping System, which is in one of your resources. Now, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening with pipelines all across the country, but the Federal Energy Regulatory Agency is the one that decides how the interstate pipelines operate in terms of siting, abandoning, storage, and also all the environmental regulations and also the terminal safety and operations, which will be happening right in our neighborhoods in Marcus Hook. So they have a very important role. They also are overseen by a separate agency. So it's not uncommon to have lots of cooks in the soup, so to say. So the Pipeline Hazardous Materials Safety Administration operate, operates actually under the Department of Transportation because it's an interstate process. They oversee the safety and security. So while one place is looking at siting, another place is looking at safe, safety and security. So they don't always speak to each other and we know that siting can make a difference in how safe they are. Um, so this is the two federal agencies and then we go down to the Pennsylvania and their regulation of intrastate pipelines within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And they direct and enforce the safety standards. And again, lots of the regulations at the federal level get passed down to the states. So they look at all of the inspections and constructions and maintenance that's happening in our state. Now, the, that's a parenthesis around that six, and I think in the previous slide, you probably saw another parenthesis. That tells you about how many people they have that are actually inspecting things on the ground. A lot of the oversight is done electronically. They send materials up to the regulators and they look them over and see if there's a problem. So there aren't a lot of boots on the ground, in other words. Now, the, also, the Department of Environmental Protection checks about the permitting process, checks on wetlands, streams, crossings, erosion and sedimentation. They are also involved in monitoring and enforcing what's going on. There are county and local agencies, but most of them have been dismissed from the process through the need to expedite pipeline construction and also to simplify issues. So many of the local conservation areas like the Delaware County conservation people, they're not really part of the pic picture right now. They were in the past, but no longer. Now, just how risky are all these pipelines? I'm sure you've heard lots of horror stories. Well, there are lots of factors that determine how risky they are. And we all have, at least if you're like me, you probably have a natural gas line coming into your house. Well, that depends on the diameter of the pipe. The ones going into your house are probably about as big as a pencil, but the ones that are going through Mariner 2 could be 22 inches in diameter, which is pretty big. So it also depends on the pressure of operation, how much force is being used to push that gas through, what's going through, whether it's methane, which is used to light your stove or your furnace, or if it's something like butane or propane or another kinds of liquefied natural gas product. So they also have to think about what the environmental variables are in the place where the pipelines are, how well they're complying with the standards. And then they have something called compliance um, with consequence areas. So for example, they have to be a lot more careful putting a pipeline in, in Delaware County than they would in Elk County. Just because we have more people here, they have to set, they're set up to abide by different standards. There are also a lot of safety issues involved. For example, the age and stage. And I think a lot of you are in your neighborhoods are seeing a lot of pipeline infra infrastructure being replaced right now. And the money for that is coming from a special fee they've added to your bill. 
So if you look, there's a fee for the replacement of those pipelines. So most of the costs are passed on to us as consumers or taxpayers. So then people say, well, you know, if their monitoring isn't that good, well, we've got some people doing that. We've got technology doing that. We've got little robots doing that. But how effective they are remains to be seen. We've seen the guys in the streets replacing the infrastructure. We have also perhaps seen a drone going through a right of way, checking out the pipelines. And one of the things that you'll notice if there's a methane leak and somebody might want to notice this in their own yard, usually the grass is dead because that kills the grass or if there's a tree growing over it in the right of way. But in remote areas, they want to have everything clear cut so they can see and make sure there's no damage being done and that so that um, they have an eye in the sky. They also have people who actually go out and look at things. They also have a system, sort of like air traffic controllers, or if you look at the, the space shuttle launches and things, they have a control access and data system that looks for leaks, checks on pressure and temperature. And so they can basically tell what's happening in pipelines in a remote location. The problem is not all pipelines are equipped to be a part of the SCADA system. And they have found in some places, for example, there have been some serious pipeline leaks um, in parts of the country where the regulator who was watching the machinery thought the machinery was malfunctioned while there was uh, actually significant spillage. We also have these robotic smart pigs, which are really cool. And they have little um, smart pig launchers that you can, they have along the pipelines where they can put these little pigs in. They're not that little, they can be you know, several feet long, 30 inches in diameter and up to 18 feet long. And they can sense the thickness of the walls, they can sense if there's erosion and corrosion and dents and cracks. So these are really helpful little devices and save us a lot of time and effort. And hopefully if they do their job, we'll be safer. Now, how can we reduce the risk? Well. One of the things we're looking at, of course, in Delaware County is siting and location. And that's where the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission comes in. And one of the things that they look for, if you're looking at environment, are things like endangered species. And that's another interesting area because in recently, they have also changed what's considered to be endangered species. So what may have worked in the past is to have a pipeline's path change may not work today. They try to avoid high populations, sensitive ecosystems, steep slopes, because that causes erosion, flood zones, which will wash away the soil and leave the pipeline bare, and calcite geology, which we have a lot of in this area, which is why you're seeing all those nice sinkholes like they've had in Chester County. One of the ways you can reduce risks is to have a lot of nice shut off valves. Because once there's a problem, the only way you're going to stop the gas leakage going through the pipes is to shut it off. And so if you have more shut off valves and they're easily accessible and easy to use, that's great. Because sometimes, like for example, in California, they couldn't find the shut off valves and they were hard to turn because they had been all corroded and rusted and they had a big problem. So we're trying to work on that as a way to reduce risks as well. The other thing is you're supposed to know where the pipelines are, but you can see there's no common signage. You also need to know to call 811 before you dig. Now, a lot of people think, well, this is stupid, you know? Even if you're putting in a mailbox, a light post outside your house, you need to call before you dig because it's not only you might hit in a pipeline or a nice little nitro, natural gas line going into your house, but you actually may hit a optic cable. And one of those cables you will pay for to be replaced. Fiber optic cables are not cheap. You also need to work on educating. Now, probably you and I know what natural gas smells like. Your grandkids probably don't. One of the problems with the Mariner 2 pipeline is because it's, it's not, um, Methane, it's not, doesn't have any odor to it. So if there's a leakage in the Mariner 2, you're not going to smell anything. However, your kids should know what natural gas smells like so they can identify it and know what to do. They should look around to see, again, to see if there are any natural gas leakages. And the way you can see them, actually, is when they're under, in a stream or a puddle or a pond. If you see bubbles coming up, there's probably a natural gas 
leak and that you might see if you're out walking in the woods and there are gathering lines out there and you see some little bubbles coming up and you don't know where they're coming from, it may be a natural gas leak. And you can also listen. For example, with a Mariner 2, probably what you're gonna hear is some kind of a hiss. So that's a good sign that there's something going wrong. So you hear hissing, you see bubbles in the water, or you smell methane if you're in the neighborhood. Everybody also needs to know about sources of ignition because if you smell natural gas in your house or you're out in the woods and you want to call the pipeline company and say, you know, listen, I think there's a natural gas leak here. Don't pick up your cell phone. Don't get in the car and turn on the key and get out of here or start your snowmobile, your all-terrain vehicle, turn on the lights. All those are sources of ignition. You're going to have a bigger problem. The idea is when you see or hear or smell a natural gas leak, you're supposed to get out of there as fast as you can, and usually to higher ground before you do any of these notifications of 911. Now, let's see what the pandemic has done for natural gas and pipelines. Well, when the pandemic first went into effect, Governor Wolf shut down construction on the Mariner 2 because he said it was not life-sustaining. However, the PUC overturned that and said, well, it really is essential construction. So they exempted the governor's order because they consider the Mariner 2 as part of a public utility. But as they continue to work on it, we know we have lots of workers coming in and out. Some of them are local to our community, some of them are not. We don't know if they're following the CDC guidelines because there's a lot of um, rules and regulations these days that have been passed about um, being on in areas close to pipelines. People have been arrested for trespassing. so. It's a very challenging effort to see if, in fact, all these guidelines are being followed. I know I see workers in my neighborhood without their masks on. I'm not sure that that's consistent with everybody else. The DEP has also had to delay a lot of their work. They're basically not having any people on the ground monitoring what's happening, so they're not looking at waterways or wetlands. They are not um, having any public hearings right now, and everything's being done by Zoom. So. We have something in common with the DEP today. <laughs> now, the other thing with the pandemic impacts, there's a lot of things that are happening in Washington that you probably are clueless about because we have a lot of other things distracting us. But Trump has uh, basically altered a lot of the regulations. Basically, the e EPA, which is our Environmental Protection Agency, has suspended all environmental laws. There are no penalties for pollution to land, air, or water, and there's no expectation for compliance or reporting. Now, that's pretty serious. That's where we are. Now, so the EPA is not protecting our public health. We don't know what's coming out of those uh, Covanta. We don't know what's come out of Del Coro. We don't know what's coming out of Marcus Hook. Air pollution increases, particularly in environmental zones. That's what's happening. So Chester is probably getting a triple whammy these days and it increases vulnerability at already at-risk populations. So we have a problem with this pandemic impact and the basically um, neglect of all of our environmental protections. One of the recent articles I saw was uh, put out that noticed that each increase of one microgram of the fine particles was associated with an annual increase in 634 deaths, 5,692 hospitalizations, and 32 patient days in the hospital. So basically, by using these, just we say omissions, we're putting ourselves at risk. And in fact, if you read in the Inquirer a little while ago, there was a uh, story about Houston, and there was a great report about that basically killing us. And that's because of these rollbacks of all of our environmental protections. And we as livers, those who live in Chester County, are victims of this because as you know, all these little particulate matters in our lungs make us more susceptible to COVID-19. Now, there are some good news with the environmental winds. So I don't wanna let you think it's all doom and gloom. Um, there's a great infographic that I will have on the website, which basically we have some good news. We have less domestic traffic, we have decreasing carbon monoxide in New York, less traffic congestion in Seattle, lots less air traffic um, in Europe. China has uh, 
just in their, China alone, they've saved 4,000 children under the age of five because they've improved the air quality because the carbon emissions have fallen by 25%. So there's a lot of things happening across the world that are making it better. On the other hand, we have waste collection workers at risk, as you know, and we have lots of medical waste. In fact, they've quadrupled since the pandemic, and we're using one billion trees every year needed to package all those things that are being shipped to us because we have all of these packages coming to our homes. For example, even in Italy, a, a, over 100% increase to spend on packaged mandarins to come to your house. So there's all different kinds of things, but then again, we've been able to ban a few plastic bags here and there. But the medical waste is really gonna be a significant issue that we have to deal with now. We also have a lot of fake news, and I know some of you know a lot about fake news, about what's happening to the wildlife and habitats. So sometimes people think, you know, they have all these wild creatures moving into our neighborhoods, and um, most of it is fake news. However, I did read in the New York Times this week that there was a great news about uh, the birds seem to be more prevalent. Maybe it's just because we're less noise, we can see them and hear them better. Now, also, you will notice that our energy needs have also changed. And one of the more interesting things is we are using less energy for driving, but we're using a lot of energy in terms of our infrastructure, in terms of our access to what's happening online. We've got lots more gaming activity. If it's that 30% increase in career, I think in, among our high school kids, it's probably about the same or greater. So a lot of us is being con consumed by our data centers and things like even putting all those pictures up on the internet so we can go and buy what we want. One of the things that was interesting is um, the New York Times, again, it's in your references, shows that the, the Trump's uh, rollback in the Trump administration and during the last election of all of the different environmental laws that have um, been either completed or in process. I noticed within the, I think it was of June 1st, the um, EPA has issued a new rollback in a sense because now they're limiting to one year any kind of question that any state may have regarding the Clean Water Act. They do not want the Clean Water Act, a compliance with the Clean Water Act, to delay the infrastructure of any process, be it a pipeline, for more than a year. So that's going to make a difference because one of the things we use lawsuits for, particularly like the eminent domain lawsuit, things like that, are to delay construction. So there was an eminent domain issue that was filed by um, people in Delaware, in Chester County that was denied because they said that uh, Senator Dinneman did not have stake, he did not have um, standing in order to issue that kind of a suit. Wetlands assessments seem to be something that make a difference in terms of looking at permits and perhaps changing them under the law. We have a right under the Pennsylvania Constitution to have clean air, pure water, and the preservation of natural resources. There's a lot of talk about using that constitutional right to change what's happening in our Commonwealth, whether the courts will agree or not. We don't know. As you know, the courts have been changing also since the last election. Um, one of the interesting things is the Chester County has also fired some hot, put in for some criminal investigations into what's happening there in terms of endangering life and property. And one of the other things that people are looking at is how the pressure that's being changed, you know, they put in one measurement as what they're going to do and then they change the measurement and then what does that do to the permitting and so forth. So all those issues are still evolving as are the inter and interstate pipeline status, which is basically resolved, but people are still trying to see if we can get something with that. We have over 80 violations from the Mariner 2, and it keeps going up all the time. They've been fined over $13.5 million for things they've done wrong. The FBI is looking at the ethics situation around the government governor's permitting and also PUC and DEP. So that's always interesting when you have um, ethics complaints being investigating and also 
there's always these merges be, and so for example sunoco logistics which we think of sunoco and mariner two is now part of energy transfer partners and usually they hire a lot of subcontractors because if anything goes wrong they like to point the finger elsewhere rather than at themselves and i saw recently in the last week that they're filing a suit for somebody who falsified welding on one of the pipelines in another part of the commonwealth but they do these things now what's next this is old news actually laura lavin gave this to me in 2014 and there's a lot of sentiment and if you follow the business sections in the news you might see that they would like to see philadelphia become the next houston and to do that they're sending crude oil which we know we're getting from north dakota you see those tank trucks coming through on the rails they are sending natural gas from northeastern pennsylvania that's down from uh, Susquehanna County, they'd like to see the gas liquids from Southwest Pennsylvania, which we're getting now through the Mariner, which is the uh, ethane, propane, and butane through the Mariner. We also would like to see natural gas coming up through the Gulf Coast and crude oil from West Africa. So we could become a real uh, hotbed for petroleum. One of the things that's coming up that you really need to be concerned about, and the Delaware River Keeper seems to be best on top of this, there's a natural gas export terminal that's being planned, liquefied natural gas. Now there's two things I wanna mention to you. There's natural gas liquids, which is coming through the Mariner II pipelines. That's ethane, propane, and butane. That has its set of risks. There are liquefied natural gas, which is basically liquid methane. And both of these things are kept under cold temperatures and great pressure to maintain the liquid state. With liquefied natural gas, for example, it's less than 260 degrees Fahrenheit and under great deal of pressure. Now, this was an old DuPont facility where they made uh, dynamite, somebody said, and they're now trying to put in docks. They have one set of docks in now, which they use for importing and exporting, but they're going to be using it. They're trying to get permitting for a second dock, which will be a liquefied natural gas export terminal. And the liquefied natural gas is going to be brought from a facility up in Wyalusing, Pennsylvania. And that's going to come down and actually in trucks and in trains. And they can have a couple of hundred train cars a day coming in there, as well as hundreds of trucks. It's not going to be a place I would like to be around. And actually, even though it's in Gibbstown, New Jersey, it's only one and a quarter miles from Tinicum, which is part of Delaware County. So that's a concern that I would have and I hope you would have. And I also read within the last week or so that they have, um, in working on this terminal, they have to deal with a lot of hazardous waste left over from the DuPont facility. And they actually have found that's polluting some of the environment with some of the materials that they're dredging out of the area and that's into the aquifer in uh, the Gibbstown area of New Jersey. So there are things there that you don't want in your water but they may be there. Another concern I have in living in Delaware County is what's happening with the sea level rise along the Delaware River and this is again from a series that's in my reference materials and you can look at it in depth most of the areas that are going to be hit by the increase in sea level are all the places where our industrial areas are. Our Covanta, Aldercora, the Marcus Hook facilities. And as you know, many of you may know that in the Marcus Hill facility, Hook facilities, there are underground caverns where lots of these um, petroleum products have been stored in the past and will be used to store some of these natural gas liquids in the future or probably already packed jammed full with some of them since we have a glut of natural gas in the country so pipelines pandemic and the environment i hit that topic because i kept hearing about personal protective equipment and i think that's what we need to deal with the pipelines the pandemic and the environment you have your own personal story that's going to impact how you deal with pipelines in your environment you need to protect yourself by finding the reasons why you need to do this and you need to equip yourself with the resources to go out and make a difference because it's going to take everyone to do something well how can you make a difference well one of the things that a lot of this ethane is being used for is 
for plastics. So you know what you have to do with plastics. Reuse them. Conserve them. Don't take them in the first place. Um, there's a lot of things you can learn more. Again, they provide them on the natural on the website. You can do things with your money. You can divest in oil and gas. You can support environmental groups. You can fund legal action. If I were you, that's where I think that slows things down the best. You contribute to candidates who share your values. There's lots of local advocacy groups to use your time and your money and your energy. And again, just like all political things, it happens locally first. You've got to start attending those zoning meetings, those environmental hearings, the health meetings. You know, you can regulate light and noise around pipelines and pipeline facilities like compressor stations that are or pumping stations. You can classify the operations as industrial and then when you zone them, they'll be zoned appropriately. You can, one thing that's really needed is to enhance the emergency preparedness and training. I don't think people know what to do with pipelines in their neighborhoods and actually continue to monitor and monitor and assess the health and environmental impacts. Data is always useful in making decisions and scientific data should be valued. Again, the county also makes a difference. You've got to encourage the funding, you've got to enhance that preparation, you've got to support the oversight and planning. And if Delaware County had perhaps been more proactive in the planning, we might not have pipelines where they are being placed today. One of the neatest things that I found that's happening recently is we now have a Chief of Environmental Crimes Unit in Delaware County. So the DA's office hosts Melissa Muroff. So in fact, now we have someone who can actually look at something if you think something illegal is going on. At the state level, there are legislators who can make a difference. They need to fund the Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, which is taking care of the state parks, things like you know Ridley Creek. We can protect the regulations because the regulations at the federal level should be the minimum. We can always do more than the federal level, although most legislators are reticent to do so. We need to pay attention to the alerts from the different environmental groups. If you get them, they say, you know, this bill is coming up today in the Senate, get on the phone and call them up. And again, health and safety is something that every legislator and elected official are sworn to protect. And the Pennsylvania Constitution, which they swear they'll uphold, also has a right to clean air, pure water, and the preservation of our natural resources. Remind them. You've got federal people who can advocate. Again, look at public lands, look at safety, advocate for our farmers, advocate for alternative energy, and advocate for keeping our natural resources in our country. You can make a difference using social network. You can write letters to the editor. You can speak at hearings and you can provide written input. The environmental, Pennsylvania Environmental Digest tells you where all these hearings are, when they're happening, what the issues are. Doesn't take much to figure out with Google today what's wrong. So put in your comments. So I took some of the questions that people asked me and I tried to answer them. Well, what's the green plans in Delco? Well, actually there is a plan. It's Delco 2035, it's multidisciplinary. And they've already initially borrowed $10 million to make some of that happen. Check it out. Someone said, well, what could Swarthmore do? Well, one of the things that Swarthmore has is a strong sustainability program. They can be a model. They can be a resource. They can speak truth to power. One of the good things about Swarthmore, unlike, say, Westchester, is they don't depend on state money. And there's a lot of politics involved with what you can say and what you can't say when you're related to things that are connected to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. As an independent school, they have a lot more power to speak truth to, to those in control. There's a lot of youthful passion. We have a lot of gray hair in our the league. We can certainly write the letters and do that kind of thing, but there's nothing like youthful passion to move things. We can see that happening in our world today. Um, get that input out there. You, we need to think like climate change and all those things globally, but really things happen locally. And you can organize others to make a difference. For example, environmental justice, you can get grants to do things and you can involve yourself in political action. Now, some people have questions about the Mariner. Well, the Mariner is actually a three in one project. First, there was the Mariner One, which was an eight inch pipeline built in the 1930s that was supposed to send liquefied petroleum products like gasoline out to the Pittsburgh area but they decided they didn't need to do that anymore. So they refurbished it, turned it around, and now the natural gas liquids 
are shipped down from that same region into Marcus Hook. So that's operating now. Then there's Mariner 2 that began in uh, 2017. And there were lots of delays with that with lawsuits, well pollution and so forth. And it was supposed to be operate, it is, was, did become operational in 2018 because they gerrymandered, I shouldn't say gerrymandered, they jerry-rigged some of the pipelines in the area of Ch Marcus Hook so they can subdivide it up so it's not 20 inches all the way so it could get into Marcus Hook. But the whole 20 inch pipeline is expected to be completed in 2020. And the Mariner 2X, which is a 16 inch pipeline parallel to number two is still under construction. It's expected to be completed in 2020. So we'll wait and see what happens. Right now they're constructing and working like very hard to make it complete because it's a matter of money. Now this is not very clear, but hopefully you can see it. These are just some of the permit problems with the Sunoco transfer pipeline. And every one of those delays have made a difference. So it didn't meet its original deadline. One of the things that legal action does is delays the pipeline. And with delay comes some relief. And hopefully with delays will come the need for less natural gas in the first place. Somebody asked, well, what about pipelines and plastic? Why are we shipping all this ethane over to Scotland? Well, it's all a matter of money and supply and demand. The blue lines, this is for methane, but it works pretty much across the board for all of natural gas products. They're priced differently in different parts of the world, and we can get more money abroad than we can here. Well, homeowner issues are eminent domain, sinkholes, polluted wells, right-of-ways, noise, light, health, all those issues are real. Well, all I can say is people take them to the courts, but usually what happens is money talks. That's all I can say. And money buys influence and influence can make decisions happen that might otherwise not. There's also someone asked, well, well, how do we unify efforts? You know, it seems funny. We've got the Penn Environment over here and Penn Future over there and Sierra Club there and Audubon here and Clean Air and Clean Water and Delaware Riverkeeper, you know, what's going on? Well, I think with vested, there, with nonprofits, there's always a vested interest. They're all looking for the same resources. One of the things I found interesting in looking at particularly the Gibbstown site, there's something called the New Jersey Environmental Alliance and I don't know how they did it, but they got everybody on the same page. Maybe we need a common enemy. Maybe Swarthmore can help us get our act together. But there's a lot of environmental groups in our area. And I don't, sometimes we're not always on the same page, working in the same time level, and we're you know, sort of spinning our wheels. I thought Chester City would be a great goal for everybody to focus on around this area because they are an environmental justice area. We're dealing with environmental justice right now. They're losing population. They're in a zone where they keep putting more things that are hazardous to people's health. The University of Pennsylvania has been working there trying to monitor some of the air quality issues. They've got air quality issues, they've got water quality issues, they've got climate change that's gonna impact the water level along their streets, they're getting flooded out already. So that seems like to me, the low hanging fruit. The other thing someone asked about, well, how do we find out what's going on? How do we get involved? What's going on with the permits in Marcus Hook? Are they gonna do this or that? Well, the place to go is the Delaware, I'm sorry, the Department of Environmental Protection, and there's a Southeast region. And if you go for community information, you can see exactly what's on the agenda and what the deadlines are. So that's a great place to go. And you can see that on the website as well. Now, basically I would say, we are dealing with a David and Goliath fight when we're talking about pipelines. So, basically support legal action, advocate, and work for campaign finance reform. My goodness, if you have read Deep Drilling, Deep Pockets, you know that the natural gas industry is not supporting only one party. They support both parties substantially. And Representative Vitale a few years ago did a great report showing just how much money local and state officials are getting, mostly state officials, I should say, um, are getting from the natural gas industry. And that again, promotes influence, it promotes decisions that may not be helpful to public health and the environment. And of course you wanna vote. Voting makes a difference. 
That's the league's line for hundreds of years, 100 years, and it will continue to be our line. So moving on, thank you. I know you've been listening hard and long, and hopefully anything you didn't get, you'll be able to get on the resources. Okay. Roberta, thank you so much for that incredibly insightful presentation. And I love the fact that it was so practical, practical where we can go and find information and to become involved and where the needs are. So thank you for not making it so theoretical, but making it so actionable. Um, I want to thank everybody today for participating. And um, we want to wish everyone a really wonderful summer. And we look forward to seeing everybody in the fall for our, the continuation of our Hot Topic program. If you would like to stay online for a few more moments and make some comments about what you learned or uh, comments that have, you ha are inspired by, the, by what you've learned today, we won't close the meeting Five or five or ten minutes. So if you do like to make some comments, make sure that you unmute yourself. And then after you make a comment, please mute yourself again. But we would love to hear your comments about what you think is important, what you'll be doing going forward with these issues, what you learned, um, and what your thoughts are. So the floor is open for comments. I would just like to comment, someone requested the slides. I will send the presentation to Anne if she chooses to just right. have the slides. It, and we can, is it, would it be okay if we posted your slides on our website? As, as long as I don't get involved in legal action, I'm happy. Okay. Great, so please feel free to come forward with some of your thoughts or comments and what you learn or what you think the important issues are going to be for you. Okay, can everyone hear me? This is uh, Mort Rabinowitz, uh, Gloria is right next to me. Uh, just yesterday, uh, you know, too short for uh, to be included in anything presented at today's meeting, the Philadelphia Inquirer had a very long and detailed article. To, instead of my background, I'm a chemical engineer. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a different company uh, over at Gibstown. It's, uh, the name of the company is Solvay, S-O-L-V-A-Y. It's a Belgian company. And uh, they had been working on developing replacements for these nasty PFOAs, PFOAs that have been uh, contaminating the water in a couple of the Pennsylvania suburban counties near Philadelphia. Uh, and apparently some of the substitutes have gotten into the groundwater uh, in the vicinity of the Solvay plant, which I think is also close to Gibstown. Uh, and um, anyway, Roberta, uh, if you want, I can send you uh, a link to the article in just yesterday's inquiry. Uh, you can then disseminate it out to uh, the league if that's appropriate. That's great. And it's, you know, it's not good stuff. No, it's not. Thanks, Mark. Yes. 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 This is Sarah. Can I say something? Yes. May, I, may I say something? First, thank you for bringing up the PFOs and PFAs. And it is not unlikely that they are coming from the Gibbs, the DuPont site, too. You don't know. And they're prime for getting into the groundwater and then getting into the drinking water. And that is one of the big problems with the pipelines because we never know what we're opening up in the process of putting pipelines in. But going back, Roberta, there was, it was a great talk, but sometimes we need to be able to discuss. And so, one of the things that I wanted to ask about, permitting in my area in Chester County, because I'm very much involved with the pipelines, is not being followed through on, which leads to one of the big problems. It's actually twofold. What EPA regulates Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act are so important. And if they dilute their acts, which they are doing, that makes it very difficult for the states to do anything. And we have to be aware of that. 
we are having a problem with our state and DEP. And I know this from direct involvement and from going to Harrisburg, et cetera, and talking to people who are trying to get some responses from DEP. DEP, we don't know how bad it is. Is it as bad as it was with the predecessor, our governor before Wolf? But these are things that really need to be looked into. So people who are advocates, go for it. Bite their ankles. Go up to their kneecaps because they continue to do this and it's not just pipelines, it's the whole issue with the um, military facilities where we had the BFAs and the BFOs. Neither EPA nor DEP are doing anything. So unless we get up on our whatever and start screaming, yelling, and get really involved, They'll continue to do nothing. And we can say, well, the Constitution says, and that's true, our Constitution does say we have the right to clean air, clean water, et cetera. And it said it from the very what, beginning, day one. Work on it. Let people know. Talk to DEP directly. Tell them they are not doing their job. Catch them out whenever they are not doing their job. Talk to the governor. I don't know how far out the governor is. I think he's better than what we had before, but I don't know if he isn't caught between a rock and a hard place. But there are legal actions that. being looked at all those areas, Sarah. The governor, DEP, all those things are being scrutinized. What happens remains to be seen. Not interested in scrutiny. Well, legal, legal, con, you know, criminal complaints. No. Uh, been legal, filed. legal can should be, and I think legal is a great way to go. But we, the people who are on the ground, we have got to raise our voices because mm -hmm. unless we do, nobody's going to listen. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. May I ask a question? Uh, actually, I really have two, but uh, first I want to say thank you so much for this really enlightening presentation. Uh, and uh, I feel so motivated to get out there and, and make a difference. Thank you. Robin, can you introduce yourself, please? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Robin Schaufler. Um, I often go by Robin like the bird, so people know how to spell my name. Uh, and uh, I am not actually a member of the League of Women Voters. I've been planning to join it for some time, but been uh, busy with other political activism uh, in different directions. But now I think it's time to get back to the League of Women Voters. And um, this, this presentation is really uh, helping getting me motivated to get back to the League of Women Voters. So. Um, uh, I was wondering, first of all, does uh, uh, the, is this the Delaware County League of Women Voters or is which organization, which level of organization of League of Women Voters is this? Yeah, yes, we are the Central Delaware County League of Women Voters and we are part of the uh, Delaware County. Uh, where there's two leagues in that area. There's the Radnor League, which um, Roberta is involved with, and this, and we work very close together in partnership, but it's a part of the interleague of the Delaware County League. So if you wanted to join, depending on where you live, you would join the Central Delaware County League or Roberta's League. I see. Thank you. Uh, so if you yeah. And then um, I was also, I, I also had a question for Roberta. Uh, Roberta, do you know anything about what uh, what is being done uh, either at the state or federal level about uh, monitoring and um, uh, regulating methane emissions from animal agriculture? Yes, there is some legislation 
in Harrisburg. I know Representative Vitale has been involved with a lot of the methane emission issues because a lot of a lot of people yell and scream about the natural gas methane emissions, which are fairly significant and are being shown to be much higher than they had previously anticipated. But we know that animal and large agricultural facilities are also significant contributors to the methane issues in our country, as is, you know, the melting of the tundra in, in Russia. So there are lots of contributors to methane emissions. And one of the things I just read, if you get climate change action or climate change today, there was a gentleman who was doing a lot of research on methane emissions in Colorado, who was supposedly like one of the world's expert, who was just fired from the University of Colorado. So you just might look up the University of Colorado because I think he was getting um, probably the kinds of data that people did not want to see who were making decisions. Oh my God. Uh, so Roberta, how can I reach you? I want to get uh, more information about this and also uh, Barbara or Anne, how do I get a copy of the recording of, of this, uh, this Zoom session? Because um, this is going a little too fast for me to take notes. Um, hi, Robin. Uh, what we're going to do is we're a team uh, putting on these programs and uh, Part of our team, we have a wonderful person, Kathy Youngman, who is going to be taking care of the recording end. She, she's actually started the recording. She's going to edit it some to, you know, get to the essence of the program. And then we'll put that link up on the page that we talked about at the beginning. And um, Barbara is going to be sending out the link to our webpage, to this issues page, to everybody that was registered. So you'll have it that way. So give us a couple of days to get the cleaned up and up on the website, but it'll be there. Uh, Roberta's willing kindly to share her slides and we'll also put those up. So hopefully that helps. And uh, there's a link to Roberta's email address at the bottom of the issues page that's titled the environment and natural resources, which you're gonna be getting. So you'll have a link to her email, so you can contact her that way. So you know I was fast and furious because I was supposed to have a 20 minute presentation. It's sort of like <laughs> a no, real okay. I just want to suggest that all of us could be one group within the league or however you want to do it. So there'd be one group on this issue and we could keep in touch with each other and email our, our representatives, you know, it's so hard to work with five different groups, but what if we were just one group? So you can let Roberta or Barbara know if you think that's a good idea. I would be happy to work with everybody here. Well, I already work, we have a group that's called Del Congo, which is made up of people from different um, environmental groups, Swarthmore and others that you know comes and goes but it's basically delaware county natural gas operations so we called it del congo and uh, okay people are interested in that we usually meet once a month i haven't been meeting with people for the last couple of months because right. of, of the pandemic and i just right. you know you have to pick your priorities how's That's, that that would be fine i didn't know about that thank you i would be happy to be a part of that well, well, if you're interested in the card Del Congo, let Ann know through the website, and I'll okay. add you to my list, and you'll get all the stuff I send out Great. periodically. Kate, right, Sarah? Kate, Great, thanks. To Kate's point yes. and to Robin's question, there is, and Kate knows, there is uh, the Delaware County League of Women Voters, ILO, which is the interleague organization, representing both of our leagues. And uh, so, Robin, when you join either one of the leagues, you automatically become a member of the Delaware County League of Women Voters. They also have a web page. Uh, it's a work in progress right now. We're transitioning to a newer look. The page that we've been talking about on this Central Delaware County page is going to be cloned and put over also onto the Delaware County um, League page. So we just want you to take that information and share it out with whomever you want and just keep educating people. Thank you. And could I just add one thing in here? And that is, we, we keep talking about the website, but in case people don't know, it's www.lwv, 
CDC for Central Delaware County dot org, and that then you get there. There's a place to join. There's a place that you can go to issues, and then you'll find the environmental. So that just in case not everybody knows where our website is. Any other comments? One thing I wanted to mention is I think I told there may be something I will send to Anne that um, University of Pennsylvania the multi I think it's called the multi municipality municipality environmental group is having the the um, Dr Horvath from Penn talk about the air quality monitoring in 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 Chester I think it's Wednesday night am I correct Anne did you get that notice. Okay, I'll send it to you in case people want to find out about the air quality in Chester because, you know, water you can sort of keep local. I not, you know, water and air don't know about state and municipal boundaries. But um, what's happening in Chester affects all of us. Roberta, I have all the emails, the addresses of everybody who participated, so I can send you those, and then you would you would know everybody who's interested in this topic. And you could include them in your, you know, emails. I'm not sure they want to be included. Let them let Anne know. Okay. It's um, right. Okay. Any other comments? Thank you for your patience. Oh, thank, thank you, you, Roberta. Appreciate. We thank really you. appreciate your um, all your work and study on this subject and and, and educating us and. Yes, thank you very much. Hope everybody has a wonderful summer and please stay in touch with us. Uh, you'll, you will get further information throughout the summer uh, of what we're planning in the fall. So our next uh, hot topic discussion will be in September. Hope you have a wonderful summer and uh, we look forward to seeing you again back in the fall. <laughs>